Hello, this is my research proposal, Increasing ADHD Diagnoses in America. This is for my Psychology 790 capstone project for Southern New Hampshire University, dated May 11, 2019. Today, I will be talking about what ADHD is, how someone is diagnosed, who is affected, and the epidemiology of it, the increasing prevalence across the U.S. and throughout the world as well, possible correlations of this increase of diagnoses, the actual research proposal, the different benefits, limitations, and rectifications of those limitations for my research proposal. So what is ADHD? Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder is a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity that interferes with functioning or development. That came straight from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 2013. On a spectrum of mild, moderate, and severe, there are different levels of ADHD that relate to interference of functioning or development, especially with daily life. It can be present also without hyperactivity. This is a different subtype known as attention deficit disorder. Who is affected? The epidemiology of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Generally present in childhood during primary school age. This means that ADHD should be starting to be noticed in elementary school. It's much more common in boys than girls, and everyone is affected by ADHD, more and more now with the rapidly growing diagnoses across America. It can affect parents, teachers, their friends, and any other significant relationships that a child is involved with. The rate at which children are diagnosed with ADHD in the United States is largely increasing. Research shows that from 2006, only 3.3% of children aged about 3 to 19 were prescribed ADHD medication. That number increased significantly to 3.9% in 2012. That is a 0.5 million increase of ADHD medication prescriptions. If this trend were to continue, we could predict relatively well that 4.6% of children would be prescribed ADHD medication by the end of 2019. If we review this graph below us, we can compare it to the research from the last slide. The previous slide showed stats of about 3 to 4% of ADHD children taking ADHD medication. This graph, however, tells us how many in a survey were told at some point in their lives by a professional that they had ADHD. The number of children reported being told they have ADHD raised from about 6% in 1997 to over 9% in 2017, a 50% increase. The three possible correlations will be revealing in our research are the broadening of diagnostic criteria, two, the changes in eating habits over time throughout America, and three, increasing awareness and acceptance of ADHD. If we broaden the diagnostic criteria, it is easy to assume that more people will fit into that category. Multiple studies would like to link diet and exercise as well. General awareness and acceptance of all mental health disorders, including ADHD, may also be a possible correlation, as in number three. First, let's start with the broadening diagnostic criteria. Changes from the DSM-4, the DSM-4-TR text revision, and the DSM-5 are largely noted here. There are now five instead of six symptoms that need manifestation to occur, as well as the age of occurrence of onset has changed from up to the age of 7 to up to the age of 12. 
this widens both categories in terms of age and minimum symptom manifestation. And now the symptoms only must reduce the quality of life in certain areas versus having clinical significance. It's also important to note that autism spectrum disorder is no longer an exclusionary principle. A second possible correlation of increased diagnoses is the changes in eating habits over time. A study in 2017 showed that high sugar and decreased consumption of healthy fats increased the likelihood of receiving a diagnosis for ADHD. Another study with over a thousand participants regarding Western style eating compared to a healthy or more Eastern or traditional style of eating showed higher risk of ADHD development. It is also important to understand that less exercise and more non-physical activities could be a potential factor as well. And thirdly, there are probably many more correlating factors such as genetics and environments, but we decided to go based on these three possible correlations due to the information regarding them in scientific journals. So our third and last possible correlation we'll be going over is in is the increased awareness and acceptance of ADHD. There is less stigma pointed towards children with it, and teachers are now much more knowledgeable about the condition, with a study in 2013 showing that nearly all were able to tell if a child had a attentional problem. There's also a general mental health awareness throughout the last few decades as the zeitgeist towards mental health and mental health disorders and awareness in America has been changing. Today we are proposing questionnaires to be sent out to clinicians and teachers. These questionnaires will be quantitative, feasible, reproducible, and continuable. So they will be quantitative because we estimate that about 600 in each group of clinicians and a group of 600 teachers to be statistically significant, which is the number of surveys that we will send out. Feasible, it's able to be done relatively easily. Reproducible, it can be done again with a different population set, expecting relatively similar results. Continuable. We could add on to this study if results are not conclusive or we still need more information. Our population samples are picked very specifically. There are differences, similarities, similarities and insights that we can rely on. Clinicians, they see patients. Kids, they diagnose. They treat. While teachers see children every day and the results of an increased ADHD population in their classroom. It's very good to get two different perspectives. This study will be ethically sound. There will be no harm done. The only cost is time for the participants. Confidentiality. The surveys will be anonymously sent through the company's email organizations which are secured and the results will be sent securely to the researchers with no name and just a participation participant ID with the answers of the survey. The benefits will be a better understanding of ADHD. We will be able to start to find ways to decrease prevalence of this disorder. We could potentially reduce correlating factors, thus improving human development for future generations. The possible limitations of this study is that there are not very many qualitative measures, and there are no subjective 
clinical opinions. There may be participant bias as well as incentive bias. The way we will rectify this is with our survey retestability over time. We'll place write-in portions for professional subjective opinions. The survey will have validity questions and there will be a debriefing of the incentive once the entirety of the organization has completed the survey. As for the incentive, there are certain dollar amounts that will be given to the participants based on their completion of the survey. Once all participants are done, the organization will receive the funding to distribute to all of the people who completed the survey. So in conclusion, the levels of ADHD across the United States are on the rise. It is our responsibility as future psychologists, clinicians, therapists alike, to help. We hypothesized three correlating factors of increased diagnosis. We chose these three correlating factors. We chose these three factors because they are three of the factors that have the most scientific research backing them. Our research proposal of surveys to clinicians and teachers will help us better understand this increase of diagnoses. There will be steps in the future and things we can do after the research is completed. Depending on what correlating factor appears to be, appears to be the most prevalent, such as increased awareness, we could continue increased awareness if the diagnostic features changing appeared to be the most prevalent then we could work on changing those and if diet and exercise are the most prevalent factors then we could in work on different programs to encourage a better lifestyle and healthier diet across the United States to help lower ADHD rates and all my sources here are the two surveys one for the clinicians and one for the teachers thank you and that will be all